All right, welcome back. Um, uh, something to mention, uh, somebody asked on the forums, really good question, uh, was like, how do I deal with version control and notebooks? Uh, uh, the question was something like, every time I change the notebook, Jeremy goes and changes it on Git, and then I do a Git pull, and I end up with a conflict, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's that happens a lot with notebooks, because notebooks behind the scenes are JSON files, which like every time you run even a cell without changing it, it updates that little number saying like what numbered cell this is, and so now suddenly there's a change. And so trying to merge notebook changes is a nightmare. Um, so my suggestion, like a simple way to do it, is, is when you're looking at um, some notebook, uh, like lesson two, RF interpretation, you want to start playing around with this. Um, first thing I would do would be to go file, make a copy, and then in the copy say file rename, and give it a name that starts with TMP, and that will hide it from Git, right? And so now you've got your own version of that notebook that you can that you can play with, okay? And so if you now do a Git pull, and see that the original changed, it won't conflict with yours, and you can now see there are two different versions. Um, there are different ways of kind of dealing with this Jupyter Notebook Git problem, like everybody has it. One one is there are some hooks you can use that like remove all of the cell outputs before you commit to Git, but in, in this case I actually want the outputs to be in the repo so you can read it on GitHub and see it. Um, so it's a minor issue, but it's, uh, it's something which catches everybody. Um, uh, yes, Terence. Before we move on to interpretation of the random forest model, I wonder if we could summarize the relationship between the uh, hyperparameters on the random forest and its uh, effect on, you know, overfitting and dealing with collinearity and yada yada yada. Yeah, that sounds like a question born from experience. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go back to lesson one RF. Um, if you're ever unsure about where I am, you can always see my top here, Courses, ML1, Lesson 1, RF. Um, in terms of the hyperparameters that uh, are interesting, and I'm ignoring, um, I'm ignoring like pre-processing, but just the actual hyperparameters, the first one of interest, I would say, is the set RF samples um, command, which determines how many rows are in each sample, so in each tree, built, created from how many uh, rows? Is that tree or nodes? In each tree. Ah. Right. So before we start a new tree, we uh, either bootstrap a sample, so sampling with replacement from the whole thing, or we pull out a, a subsample of a, of a smaller number of rows, and then we build a tree from there. So. So step one is we've got our whole big data set, and we grab a few rows at random from it, and we turn them into a smaller data set, and then from that we build a tree, right? So uh, that's the size of that is set RF samples. So when we change that size, um, let's say this originally had like a million rows, and we said set RF samples 20,000, right? And then we're going to grow a tree from there. Um, Assuming that the tree remains kind of balanced as we grow it, can somebody tell me how many layers deep would this tree be? And assuming we're growing it until every leaf is of size one. Yes. Uh, log base two. Log base two of twenty thousand. Right. Okay. So the the depth of the tree doesn't actually vary that much depending on the number of samples, right? Because it's it's uh, related to the log of the size. Um, can somebody tell me at the very bottom, so once we go all the way down to the bottom, how many leaf nodes would there be? Speak up. What? 20,000, right? Because every single leaf node has a single thing in it. So we've got uh, obviously a linear relationship between the number of leaf nodes and the size of the sample. So when you decrease the sample size, um, it means that there are less kind of 
final decisions that can be made, right? So therefore the tree is is going to be less rich in terms of what it can predict because it's just making less different individual decisions and it also is making less binary choices to get to those decisions. So therefore setting RF samples lower is going to mean that you overfit less, but it also means that you're going to have a less accurate individual tree model, right? And so remember the way Bryman, the inventor of random forest, described this is that you're trying to do two things when you build a model, um, when you build a model with bagging. Um, one is that um, each individual tree, or as SK Learn would say, each individual estimator is as accurate as possible, right, on the training set. Um, so it's like each model is a strong predictive model. But then the Across the estimators, the correlation between them is as low as possible, so that when you average them out together, you end up with something that generalizes. So by decreasing the set RF samples number, we are actually decreasing the power of the estimator and increasing the correlation. And so Is that going to result in a better or a worse validation set result for you? It depends, right? This is the kind of compromise which you have to figure out when you do machine learning models. Um, can you pass that back there? If I base, if I put the OOB value equal to two, uh, so it is it is basically dividing every third. It ensures that uh, every third set of the data. Won't be there in each tree, right? The OOB, say again. OOB. If I put OOB equal to true yep. in random forest, yep. so isn't that make sure that out of my entire data, 37% of data won't be there in every tree? So all OOB equals true does is it says um, whatever your subsample is, it might be a bootstrap sample or it might be a, 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 a subsample. Take all of the other rows, right, and put them into a for each tree, and put them into a different data set, and calculate the the error on those. So it doesn't actually impact training at all. It just gives you an additional metric, which is the OOB error. So if you don't have a validation set, um, then this allows you to get kind of a, a, a quasi validation set uh, for, for free. If I don't set out of sample, what is the default? If you what sorry? If I don't set out of sample, set out of uh, sample. The, if I don't set RF sample. RF sample. Yeah. So the the default is um, actually if you say uh, reset RF samples, and that causes it to bootstrap. So it'll sample a new data set as big as the original one, but with replacement. Okay, so um, obviously the second benefit of set RF samples is that you can run uh, more quickly, and particularly if you're running on a really large data set, like a hundred million rows, you know it won't be possible to run it on the full data set. So you would either have to pick a subsample if you, yourself before you start, or you set RF samples. Um, the second key parameter um, that we learnt about was min samples leaf. Okay, so if I changed min samples leaf before we assumed that min samples leaf was equal to one all right if i set it equal to two then what would be my new depth how deep would it be yes log base 2 20000 minus one okay so uh, each time we double the min samples leaf we're removing one layer from the tree Um, and uh, Fang, I'll come back to you again since you're doing so well. How many um, leaf nodes would there be in that case? Fang? How many leaf nodes would there be in that case? 10,000. Okay, so we're going to be again, dividing the number of leaf nodes by that number. So 
The result of increasing min samples leaf is that now each of our leaf nodes has more than one thing in so we're going to get a, a, a more stable average that we're calculating in each tree okay um, um, we've got a little bit less depth okay we've got less decisions to make and we've got a smaller number of leaf nodes so again we would expect the result of that would be that each estimator would be less predictive um, but the estimators would be also less correlated so again this might help us to avoid overfitting could you pass the uh, microphone over here please Um, hi, Jeremy. I'm not sure if um, in that case every node will have t exactly two observations. No, it won't necessarily have exactly two, and, and I thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so it, it might try to do a split. And so one reason, well, what would be an example, Chen Shi, that you wouldn't split even if you had a hundred nodes? What might be a reason for that? Sorry, a hundred items in a leaf node. They're identical. They're all the same. Uh, they're all the same in terms of Once. The independent or the dependent? Of the, um, the dependent. And in terms of the dependent, right? I mean, I guess either, but much more likely would be the dependent. So if you get to a leaf node where um, every single one of them has the same auction price or in classification, like every single one of them is a dog, then there is no split that you can do that's going to improve your information, right? And remember, information is the term we use in a kind of a, a general sense in Random Forest to describe. Um, Uh, the amount of difference about about of additional information we create from a split is like how much are we improving the model so you'll often see this this word information gain which means like how much better did the model get by adding an additional split point um, and it could be based on RMSE or it could be based on cross entropy or it could be based on how different are the standard deviations or or whatever so that's just a general term Okay, so that's the second thing that we can do, which again, it's going to speed up our training because it's like one less set of decisions to make. Remember, even though there's one less set of decisions, those decisions like have as much data again as the previous set. So like each layer of the tree can take like twice as long as the previous layer. So it could definitely speed up training uh, and it could definitely make it uh, generalized better. Um, So then the third one that we had was um, max features. Uh, who wants to tell me what max features uh, does? Uh, do you want to pass that back over there? Okay, Vinay. So max features determines how many features you're going to use in each tree. Now in this case, it's a fraction half. So you're going to use half, half the features for each tree. Nearly right or kind of right. Can you be more specific or can somebody else be more specific? It's not exactly for each tree Chen Shi that, Is it for each tree randomly sample half of the uh, features? So not quite it's not for each tree So the the, the set do you want to pass it to Karen? So the set RF samples picks a Picks a subset of samples A subset of rows for each tree, but min samples leaf. Uh, sorry, but um, max features doesn't quite do that. It does something different. Uh, at each split, we will be picked. at each at each split. Set split. 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 It will. It will pick randomly half. Yeah. Right. Columns. So it kind of sounds like a small difference, but it's actually quite a different way of thinking about it. Which is, um, we do our set RF samples, so we pull out our subsample or our bootstrap sample, and that's kept. For the whole tree um, and we have all of the columns in there right and then with um, max features equals 0.5 at each point we then at each split we pick a different half of the features and then here we'll take a pick a different half of the features and here we'll pick a different half of the features and so the reason we do that is because we want the trees to be as as rich as possible right So particularly like if you if you were only doing a small number of trees like you had only 10 trees and you picked the same column set all the way through the tree you're not really getting much variety in what kind of things are confined okay so this this way at least in theory um, uh, seems to be something which is going to give us a better set of trees is picking a different random subset of features uh, at every decision point the overall 
So the overall effect of max features again, it's the same It's going to mean that the tr each individual tree is probably going to be less accurate um, But the trees are going to be more varied and in particular here This can be critical because like imagine that you've got one feature. That's just super predictive It's so predictive that like every random subsample you look at always starts out by splitting on that same feature then the trees are going to be very similar in the sense like they all have the same initial split, right? But there may be some other interesting initial splits because they create different interactions of variables. So by like half the time, that feature won't even be available at the top of the tree, so half, at least half the trees are going to have a different initial split. So it definitely can give us more variation, uh, and therefore again it can help us to create more generalized trees that have less correlation with each other, even though the individual trees probably won't be as predictive. In practice, uh, we actually looked at, uh, have a little picture of this, that as, as you add more trees, right, if you have max features equals none, that's going to use all the features every time, right, then with like very, very few trees, that can still give you a pretty good uh, error. But as you create more trees, it's not going to help as much because they're all pretty similar because they're all trying every single variable. Um, where else if you say max features equals square root or max features equals log 2, then uh, as we add more estimators, we see improvements. Okay, so there's an interesting interaction between those two. And this is from the sklearn docs, this cool little chart. Okay. Um, so then things which don't impact our, our training at all, and jobs, simply says how many CPU, how many cores do we run on, okay, so it'll make it faster up to a point. Generally speaking, making this more than like eight or so, they may have diminishing returns. Um, minus one says use all of your cores. Um, so there's, there's, I don't know why the default is to only use one core, that seems weird to me. Um, you'll definitely get more performance by using more cores, because all of you have computers with more than one core nowadays. And then OOB score equals true. Um, simply allows us to see the OOB score. If you don't say that, it doesn't calculate it. Um, and particularly if you had set RF samples pretty small compared to a big data set, OOB is going to take forever to calculate. Uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to fix the library so that doesn't happen. There's no reason it need be that way, but right now that's that's how the library works. Okay. So there our Basic, you know, key basic um, parameters that we can change. Um, there are more uh, that you can see in the docs or shift tab to have a look at them. Um, but the ones you've seen are the ones that I've found useful to play with. Um, so feel free to play with others as well. Um, and generally speaking, you know, max features of, as I said, max features of like either um, uh, none uh, means all of them. Um, um, about 0.5 uh, or um, square root uh, or log, you know, kind of those three seem to work pretty well. And then for min samples leaf, um, you know, I would generally try kind of 1, 3, 5, 10, 25, you know, 100. And like as you start doing that, if you notice by the time you get to 10, it's already getting worse, then there's no point going further. If you get to 100, it's still going better, then you can keep trying, right? But they're the kind of general amounts that most things seem to sit in. All right, so random forest interpretation um, is something which you could use to create some really cool Kaggle kernels. Now obviously one issue is the FastAI library is not available in Kaggle kernels, but if you look inside fastai.structured, right, and remember you can just use um, double question mark to look at the source code for something, or you can go into the editor to have a look at it. Um, you'll see that most of the methods we're using are a small number of lines of code in this library and have no dependencies on anything, so you could just copy that little, if you need to use one of those functions, just copy it into your kernel. Uh, and, and if you do, just say, this is from the FastAI library, you can link to it on GitHub, because it's, it's available on GitHub as open source, um, but you don't need to 
import the whole thing, right? So this is a cool trick is that because you're the first people to learn how to use these tools You can start to show things that other people haven't seen, right? So for example uh, This confidence based on tree variance is something which doesn't exist anywhere else um, Feature importance definitely does uh, and that's already in quite a lot of Kaggle kernels if you're looking at a competition or a data set that where nobody's done feature importance being the first person to do that is always going to win lots of votes because it's like the most important thing is like which features are important um, So last time we let's just make sure we've got our tree and our data um, So we need to change this to add one extra thing all right, so that's going to load in our data Split there's our data. Okay. So as I mentioned, when we do model interpretation, I tend to set RF samples to some subset, something small enough that I can run a model in under 10 seconds or so, um, because there's just no point run, running a super accurate model. 50,000 is more than enough uh, to, to see. You'll basically see each time you run an interpretation, You'll get the same results back, and so as long as that's true, then you, you're already using enough data. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so feature importance, uh, we learnt it works by randomly shuffling a column, um, each column one at a time, and then seeing how accurate the model, the pre-trained model, the model we've already built, is. Uh, when you pass it in uh, all the data as before, but with one column shuffled. So um, <clears throat> Some of the questions I got after class uh, kind of reminded me that it's very easy to underappreciate how Powerful and kind of magic this approach is um, And so to explain I'll, I'll mention a couple of the questions that I heard um, so one question was like Why don't we or what if we just um, create uh, took one column at a time and created a tree on Just each one column at a time. So we've got our data set. It's got a bunch of columns So why don't we just like grab that column and just build a tree from that right? And then like we'll see which which columns tree is the most predictive um, Can anybody tell me? Why what why that may give misleading results about feature importance? Karen. Uh, I also asked, asked this question. Okay. <laughs> so we will be going to lose the interactions between the features. Yeah. But if we just shuffle them, it will be at randomness and we will able to both capture the interactions and the importance of the feature at the same Great. time. Great. Yeah. And and so this issue of interactions is not a minor detail. It's like It's massively important. So like think about this um, Bulldozers data set where for example where there's one uh, field called year made and there's one field uh, called sale date and like If we think about it, it's pretty obvious that what matters is the combination of these two which in other words is like uh, how old is the piece of equipment when it got sold? So if we only included one of these We're going to massively underestimate how important that feature is now Here's a really important point though if you It's pretty much always possible to create a simple like logistic regression Which is as good as pretty much any random forest if you know ahead of time exactly what variables you need exactly how they interact exactly how they be, need to be transformed and so forth Right. So in this case, for example, we could have created a new field which was equal to year made uh, Sorry uh, sale date or sale year minus year made and we could have fed that to a model and got you know got that interaction for us, but the point is We never know that like you, you never like you might have a guess about I think some of these things are interacted in this way And I think this thing we need to take the log and so forth But you know the truth is that the, the way the world works the causal structures You know they've got many many things interacting in many many subtle ways, right? And so that's why using trees uh, whether it be gradient boosting machines or random forests works so well 
So um, can you pass that to Terence, please? One thing that uh, bit me uh, years ago was also uh, I tried that uh, doing one variable at a time, thinking, mm. oh, well, I'll figure out which one's most correlated with the dependent variable. But what it doesn't uh, pull apart is that what if all variables are basically copied the same variable, then they're all going to seem equally important. But in fact, it's really just one factor. Yeah, and that's also true here. So if we had like a column appeared twice, right, then shuffling that column isn't going to make the model much worse, right? There'll be, if you think about like how it was built, some of the times, particularly if we had like max features is 0.5, then some of the times we're going to get version A of the column, some of the times we're going to get version B of the column, so like half the time um, shuffling version A of the column is going to make a tree a bit worse, half the time it's going to make, you know, column B will make it a bit worse, and so it'll show um, that both of those features are somewhat important, um, and it'll kind of like share the importance between the two features. And so this is why um, I, I write collinearity, but collinearity literally means that they're linearly related, um, so this isn't quite right, um, but this is why having two variables that are related, closely related to each other, or more variables that are closely related to each other, means that you will often uh, underestimate their importance using this this random forest technique. Um, yes, Terence. And so once we've shuffled and we get a, uh, a new model, what exactly are the units of these importances? Is this a change in the R squared? Yeah, I mean it depends on the library we're using. Uh, so the units are kind of like, I, I never think about them, I, I just kind of know that like in this particular library, um, you know, 0.005 is often kind of a cutoff I would tend to use, but all I actually care about is is this picture, right, which is the um, feature importance uh, ordered for each variable, and then kind of zooming in, turning it into a bar plot, and I'm kind of like, okay, you know, here they're all pretty flat, and I can see, okay, that's about 0.005, and so I remove them at that point and just see like, the model, hopefully, the validation score didn't get worse. And if it did get worse, I'll just increase this a little bit, uh, sorry, decrease this a little bit until it, it doesn't get worse. Um, so yeah, uh, the, 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 the units of measure of this don't matter too much. Uh, and we'll learn later about a second way of doing variable importance, uh, by the way. Can you pass that over there? Uh, is one of the goals here to remove variables that uh, I guess your like your score will not get worse if you remove them, so you might as well get rid of them. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do next. So, um, so having looked at our feature importance plot, we said, okay, it looks like the ones like less than 0.005, you know, a kind of this long tail of boringness. So I said, let's try removing them, right? So let's just try grabbing the columns. Where it's greater than 0.005, and I said let's create a new data frame called DF Keep, which is DF Train with just those kept columns. Created a new training and validation set with just those columns. Created a new random forest, and I looked to see how the validation set score and the validation set RMSC changed, and I found they got a tiny bit better. Um, so if they're about the same or a tiny bit better then the thinking, my thinking is, well, this is uh, just as good a model, but it's now simpler. And so now when I redo the feature importance, there's less collinearity, right? And so in this case, I saw that year made went from being like quite a bit better than the next best thing, which was coupler system, to way better than the next best thing, right? And coupler system went from being like quite a bit more important than the next two to equally important to the next two. So it, it did seem to definitely change these feature importances and hopefully give me some more insight there. So how does that help our model in general? Like what does it mean that your made is now way ahead of the others? Like what yeah, so we're going to dig us? into that kind of now, um, but basically 
it tells us um, um, that, for example, if we're looking for like how we're we dealing with missing values, is there noise in the data? Um, you know, if it's a high cardinality categorical variable, they're all different steps we would take. So, for example, if it was a high cardinality categorical variable that was originally a string, right? Like, for example, I think like maybe fi product class description. Um, I remember one of the um, ones we looked at the other day had like first of all was the type of vehicle and then a hyphen and then like the size of the vehicle. We might look at that and be like, okay, well that was an important column. Let's try like splitting it into two on hyphen and then take that bit which is like the size of it and try and you know parse it and convert convert it into an integer. You know, we can try and do some feature engineering. And basically, until you know which ones are important, um, you don't know where to focus that feature engineering time. You can talk to your client, you know, uh, and say, uh, you know, or if, you know, in, if you're doing this inside your workplace, you go and talk to the folks that like were responsible for creating this data. So, in this, in the, if you were actually working at a bulldozer auction company, you might now go to the actual auctioneers and say, "I'm really surprised that coupler system seems to be driving people's pricing decisions so much. Why do you think that might be?" And they can say to you, "Oh, it's actually because." Only these classes of vehicles have coupler systems, or only this manufacturer has coupler systems, and so frankly, this is actually not telling you about coupler systems, but about something else. And oh, hey, that reminds me—that's that—that something else. We actually have measured that. Uh, it's in this different CSV file. I'll go get it for you. So it kind of helps you focus your attention. So I had a fun little problem this weekend. As you know, I introduced a couple of uh, crazy computations in uh, into my random forest, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh my God, these are the most important variables ever!" Squashing all of the others. But then I got a terrible score. Hmm. And then is that because uh, now that I think I have my scores computed correctly, what I noticed is that the importance went through the roof, but the validation set. Uh, was still bad or got worse. Is that because somehow that computation allowed the training to almost like an identifier map exactly what the answer was going to be for training? But of course, that doesn't uh, generalize to the validation set. Is that what I is that what I observed? Okay, so there's um, there's two reasons why your validation score might not be very good. Um, Let's go up here. Okay, so we get these five numbers, right? Uh, the um, RMSE of the training validation, R squared of the training validation, and the R squared of the OOB. Okay, so there's two reasons, uh, and really in the end, what we care about, like for this Kaggle competition, is the RMSE of the validation set, assuming we've created a good validation set. So uh, in Terence's case, he's saying this number, this this thing I care about, um, got worse when I did some feature engineering. Why is that? Okay, there's two possible reasons. Uh, reason one is that you're overfitting. If you're overfitting, then your OOB will also get worse. Uh, if you're doing a huge data set with a small set RF sample, so you can't use an OOB, then instead um, create a second validation set, which is a random sample, okay, and and do that, right? So, in other words, if your OOB or your random sample validation set is has got much worse, then you must be overfitting. Um, I think in your case, Terence, it's unlikely that's the problem because random forests don't overfit that badly. Like it's very hard to get them to overfit that badly unless you use some really weird parameters, like only one estimator, for example. Like once you've got ten trees in there, there should be enough variation that you're, you know, you can definitely overfit, but not so much that you're going to destroy your validation score by adding a variable. So I think you'll find that's probably not the case, but it's easy to check. And if it's not the case, then you'll see that your OOB score or your random sample validation score hasn't got worse. Okay, so the second reason your validation score can get worse, if your OOB score hasn't got worse, you're not overfitting, but your validation score has got worse, that means 
you're you're doing something that is true in the training set but not true in the validation set so this can only happen when your validation set is not a random sample so for example in this bulldozers competition or in the grocery shopping competition we've intentionally made a validation set that's for a different date range it's for the most recent two weeks right and so if something different happened in the last two weeks to the previous weeks um, then uh, you could totally break your validation set so for example if there was some kind of unique identifier um, which is like Uh, different in the two date periods, then you could learn to identify things using that identifier in the training set, but then like the last two weeks may have a totally different set of IDs with a different set of behavior, could get a lot worse. Um, yeah, what you're describing is not common though, um, and so I'm a bit skeptical it might be a bug, um, but hopefully there's enough uh, things you can now use to figure out if it is a bug. Uh, we'll be interested to hear what you learn. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's feature importance, and so um, I'd like to compare that to uh, how feature importance is normally done in industry and in academic communities outside of machine learning, like in psychology and economics and so forth. And generally speaking, people uh, in those kind of environments tend to use uh, Uh, some kind of linear regression, logistic regression, general linear models. Um, so they start with their data set and they basically say, well, that was weird. Um, oh, okay. So they start with their data set uh, and they say, I'm going to assume that I know the kind of parametric relationship between my independent variables and my dependent variable. So I'm going to assume that it's a linear relationship, say. Or it's a linear relationship with a link function like a sigmoid logistic regression, say. And so, assuming that I already know that, I can now write this as an equation. So if I've got like x1, x2, so forth, right? I can say, all right, my uh, y values are equal to uh, a x1 plus b x2 equals y, and therefore I can find out the feature importance easily enough by just looking at these coefficients and saying like which one's the highest, particularly if you've normalized the data first, right? So there's this kind of trope out there, it's it's very common, which is that like this is somehow more accurate or more pure or in some way better way of doing feature importance, um, but that couldn't be further from the truth, right? If you think about it, if you were like, if you were missing an interaction, Right, or if you were missing a transformation you needed, um, or if you have any way been anything less than a hundred percent perfect in all of your pre-processing, so that your model is the absolute correct truth of this situation, right? Unless you've got all of that correct, then your coefficients are wrong, right? Your coefficients are telling you in your totally wrong model this is how important those things are, right? Which is basically meaningless. So, um, where I'll say the random forest feature importance, it's telling you in this extremely high parameter, highly flexible functional form with few if any statistical assumptions, this is your feature importance. Right? Um, so I would be very cautious, you know, and, and again, I, I can't stress this enough, when you, when you leave MSAN, when you leave this program, you are much more often going to see people talk about logistic regression coefficients than you're going to see them talk about random forest variable importance, and every time you see that happen, you should be very, very, very skeptical of what you're seeing. Anytime you read a paper in economics or in psychology, or the marketing department tells you they did this regression or whatever, every single time those coefficients are going to be massively biased by any issues in the model. Um, Furthermore, if they've done so much pre-processing that actually the model is pretty accurate, then now you're looking at coefficients that are going to be of like a coefficient of some principal component from a PCA, or a coefficient of some distance from some cluster or something, at which point they're 
very very hard to interpret anyway They're not actual variables, right? So they're kind of the two options I've seen when people try to use classic statistical techniques to do a kind of a, a variable importance equivalent um, I think things are starting to change um, slowly You know, there are, there are some fields that are starting to realize that this is totally the wrong way to do things, but it's, it's been You know nearly 20 years since random forests appeared so it, 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 it takes a long time You know people say that the only way that um, Knowledge really advances is when the previous generation dies um, and that's kind of true, right? Like particularly academics, you know, they make a career of being good at a particular sub thing and um, You know often don't it you know It's not until the next generation comes along that that people notice that oh that's actually no longer a good way to do things And I think that's what's happened here um, Okay, so uh, We've got now a model which isn't really any better as a, a predictive accuracy wise um, But it's kind of we're getting a good sense that there seems to be like four main important things uh, when it was made the coupler system its size and uh, its product classification Okay, so that's cool. Um, there is something else that we can do, however, which is we can do something called uh, one-hot encoding. Um, so this is kind of where we're talking about categorical variables. So remember, a categorical variable. Let's say we had like um, uh, a string high, um, and remember the order we got was kind of back weird. It was high, low. Medium, so it was in alphabetical order by default, right? Was our original category for like usage band or something? Uh, and so we mapped it to zero, one, two, right? And so by the time it gets into our data frame, it's now a number. So the random forest doesn't know that it was originally a category. It's just a number, right? So when the random forest is built, it basically says, "Oh, is it greater than one or not?" Or is it greater than naught or not? You know, basically the two possible decisions it could have made. Um, for a, um, for something with like five or six bands, you know, um, it could be that just one of the levels of a category is actually interesting, right? So, like, if it was like very high, uh, very low, um, or or unknown. Right, then we've now got like six levels and maybe the only thing that mattered was whether it was like unknown Maybe like not knowing its size somehow impacts the price And so if we wanted to be able to recognize that and particularly if like it just so happened that the way that the Numbers were coded was that unknown ended up in the middle Right then what it's going to do is it's going to say okay there is a difference between these two groups you know less than or equal to two versus greater than two uh, And then when it gets into this this leaf here, it's going to say oh There's a difference between these two between less than four and greater than or equal to four and so it's going to take two Splits to get to the point where we can see that it's actually unknown that matters um, So this is a little inefficient and we're kind of like wasting tree computation and like wasting tree computation matters because every time we do a split we're halving the amount of data at least that we have to do more analysis So it's going to make our tree less rich uh, less effective if we're Not giving the data in a way that's kind of convenient for it to do the work it needs to do So what we could do instead is Create six columns We could create a column called is very high is very low is high is unknown is low is medium and each one would be ones and zeros right so either one or a zero So we had six columns um, just one moment um, So having added six additional columns to our data set um, the random forest uh, Now has the ability to pick one of these and say like oh, let's have a look at is unknown there's one possible split I can do which is one versus zero. Let's see if that's any good Right, so it actually now has the ability in a single step to pull out a single category level and so um, uh, This this kind of coding is called one 
hot encoding. And for many, many types of machine learning model, this is like necessary, something like this is necessary, like if you're doing logistic regression, you can't possibly put in a categorical variable that goes not through five, because there's obviously no linear relationship between that and anything, right? Um, so one hot encoding, a lot of people incorrectly assume that all machine learning requires one hot encoding, um, uh, but in this case I'm going to show you how we could use it optionally and see whether it might uh, improve things sometimes. Hi, Jeremy. So, if we have six categories, like in this case, would there be any problems with adding a column for each of the categories? So, because in, in linear regression, we said we had to do it, like if there's six categories, we should only do it for five of them. Yeah, so um, it, it you certainly can say, oh, we let's not worry about adding is medium, because we can infer it from the other five. Um, um, I would say include it anyway, um, because like rather than the, otherwise the random forest would have to say is very high no is very low no is high no is unknown low is low no okay and finally I'm I'm there right so it's like five decisions to get to that point so um, the reason in um, uh, linear models that you you need to not include one is because linear models hate collinearity. Um, but we don't care about about that here. So we can uh, do one hot encoding um, uh, easily enough, and the way we do it is we pass um, one extra parameter to procdf, which is what's the max number of categories, right? So uh, if we say it's seven, then anything with um, less than seven levels. Uh, is going to be turned into a one hot encoded bunch of columns, right? So in this case, this has got six levels, so this would be one hot encoded, where else like zip code has more than six levels, and so that would be left as a number. And so generally speaking, you obviously probably wouldn't want to one hot encode zip code, right? Because that's just going to create masses of data, memory problems, computation problems, and so forth, right? So, so this is like a, another parameter that you can play around with. So if I do that, um, uh, try it out, run the random forest as per usual, you can see what happens to the um, R squared of the validation set and to the RMSC of the validation set, and in this case I found it got a little bit worse. Uh, this isn't always the case and it's going to depend on your data set, you know, do you have a data set where you know, single categories tend to be quite important, um, or not. And in this particular case, it didn't make it more predictive. However, um, what it did do is that we now have different features, right? So procdf puts um, the name of the variable, and then an underscore, and then the level name. And so interestingly, it turns out that where else before it said that enclosure was somewhat important, when we do it as one hot encoded, it actually says enclosure erops with a C is the most important thing. So, for at least the purpose of like interpreting your model, you should always try one hot encoding, you know, quite a few of your variables. And so I often find somewhere around six or seven is pretty good. Um, you can try like making that number as high as you can so that it doesn't take forever to compute, and the feature importance doesn't include like really tiny levels that aren't interesting. So that's kind of up to you to play it, play around with. Um, but in this case, like this is actually, I found this very interesting, it clearly tells me I need to find out what enclosure erupts with AC is, why is it important, because like uh, it means nothing to me, right? And, but it's the most important thing, so I should go figure that out. Uh, Savannah had a question. Can you plus that. So can you explain how changing the max number of categories works? Because for me, it just seems like there's five categories. There's five categories. How oh yeah, sorry. That? So it's it's just like um, all it's doing is saying like, okay, here's a column called zip code. Here's a column called usage band. And 
here's a column six, right? I don't know, whatever, right? And so like zip code has whatever, 5,000 levels. The number of levels in a category, we call its cardinality, okay? So it has a cardinality of 5,000. Usage band maybe has a cardinality of six. Sex has maybe a cardinality of two. So when procdf goes through and says, okay, this is a categorical variable, should I one-hot encode it? It checks the cardinality against max n cats and says, oh, 5,000 is bigger than seven, so I don't one-hot encode it. And then it goes to usage band. Six is less than seven, I do one-hot encode it. Goes to six. Two is less than seven. I do one hot encode it. So it just says for each variable, um, how do I decide whether to one hot encode it or not? In procdf, we are keeping both label encodes and one hot encodes, right? No. Once we decide to one hot encode, it no, it, it does not that. keep the original variable. Uh, wouldn't the fact that the, maybe the best split will be an interval? And we would need a label encode. Well, you don't need a label encode if the if so if the best is an interval, it can approximate that with multiple mm -hmm. one-hot encoding levels. So in terms of efficiency, it will be yeah. Simple. So like you know, it's a the 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 truth is that each column is going to have some you know uh, different you know should it be label encoded or not you know which you could make on a case by case basis. I find in practice. It's just not that sensitive to this, and so I find like just using a single number for the whole data set has, gives me what I need. Um, but you know, if you were building a model that really had to be as awesome as possible, and you had lots and lots of time to do it, you can go through man. You know, don't use PropDF. You can go through manually and decide which things to to use dummies or not. You'll, <coughs> you'll see in 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 the code uh, if you look at the code for PropDF. Proc df, right? Like, I, I never want you to feel like um, the code that happens to be in the fast AI library is the code that you're limited to, right? So where is that done? Um, you can see that um, uh, the max n cat gets passed to numericalize, and numericalize. Simply checks. Okay, is it a numeric type, and is the number of categories either not been passed to us at all, or we've got more unique va va values than there are categories? And if so, we're going to use the categorical codes. Um, so for any column where that's uh, where it's skipped over that, right? So it's remained as a category. Then at the very end, we just go pandas dot get dummies. We pass in the whole data frame, and so pandas dot get dummies. You pass in the whole data frame. It checks for anything that's still a categorical variable, and it turns it into a dummy variable, which is another way of saying a one-hot encoding. So you know, with that kind of approach, you can easily override it and do your own dummy verification, variableization. Did you have a question? Okay. Uh, so some data has a quite obvious order, like if you have like a rating system like good, bad, uh, poor, whatever, things like that. Um, there's an order to that, and destroying that order by doing the dummy variable thing probably won't work in your benefit. So is there a way to just force it to leave alone one variable, just like convert it beforehand yourself? Um, not, not in the library. Um, and to remind you, like, unless we explicitly do something about it, we're not going to get that order. So when we um, when we import the data, this is in lesson one RF. We showed how, by default, the categories are ordered alphabetically, and we have the ability to order them properly. So. Yeah, if you've actually made an effort to turn your ordinal variables into proper ordinals, um, using procdf can destroy that if you have max n cats. So the simple thing, the simple way to avoid that is if we know that we always want to use the codes for usage band rather than the um, you know like never one hot encode it, 
you could just go ahead and replace it, right? You could just say, okay, let's just go df.usageBand equals df.usageBand.cat.codes, and it's now an integer, and so it'll never get changed. All right. So we kind of have already seen how variables which are basically measuring the same thing can kind of confuse our variable importance, um, and they can also make our random forest slightly less good because it requires like more computation to do the same thing. There's more columns to check. Um, so uh, I'm going to do some more work to try and remove redundant features. Um, and the way I do that is to do something called a dendrogram, um, and it's a kind of uh, hierarchical clustering. So cluster analysis um, is something where you're trying to look at objects, they can be either rows in a data set or columns, and find which ones are similar to each other. So often you'll see people particularly talking about cluster analysis, they normally refer to rows of data, and they'll say like, oh, let's plot it, right? And like, oh, there's a cluster, and there's a cluster, right? Um, a common type of cluster analysis, uh, time to permitting, we may get around to talking about this in some detail, is called k-means, um, which is basically where you assume that you don't have any labels at all, uh, and you take basically uh, uh, a couple of data points at random, and you gradually find the ones that are near to it and move them closer and closer to centroids, and you kind of repeat it again and again. Um, and it's an iterative approach that you basically tell it how many clusters you want, and it'll tell you where it thinks the clusters are. Um, a really, um, I don't know why, but a really underused technique, um, 20, 30 years ago, it was much more popular than it is today, is um, hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical, um, also known as agglomerative clustering, and in hierarchical or agglomerative clustering, we basically look at every pair of option, uh, every pair of objects, and say, okay, which two objects are the closest? Right. So in this case, we might go, okay, um, those two objects are the closest, and so we kind of like delete them and replace it with the midpoint of the two. And then, okay, here are the next two closest, we delete them and replace them with the midpoint of the two. And you keep doing that again and again, right? Uh, since we're kind of removing points and replacing them with their averages, uh, you're gradually reducing the number of points by pairwise combining. And the cool thing is, you can plot that like so, right? So if rather than looking at points, you look at variables, we can say, okay, which two variables are the most similar? And it says, okay, sale year and sale elapsed are very similar. So the uh, kind of horizontal axis here is how similar are the two points that are being compared, right? So if they're closer to the right, it means they're very similar. So sale year and sale elapsed have been combined, and they were very similar. What are you measuring? What is this um, Again, it's like, who cares? You know, it'll be like a correlation coefficient or something like that. You know, um, in this particular case, what I actually did, um, so you get to, to tell it. Um, so in this case, I actually used uh, Spearman's R. So uh, uh, you guys familiar with correlation coefficients already? Correlation? So correlation is, co is almost exactly the same as the R squared, right? Um, uh, but it's between two variables rather than a variable and its prediction. Um, the problem with um, a normal correlation is that um, if the I'm going to create a new workbook here. Um, if you have data that looks like this, then you can do a correlation and you'll get a good result, right? But if you've got data which looks like this, right, and you try and do a correlation. Uh, it assumes linearity. That's not very good, right? So there's a thing called a rank correlation. A really simple idea. It's replace every point by its rank, right? So instead of like, so we basically say, okay, this is the smallest, so we'll call that one, two, there's the next one, three, here's the next one, four, five, right? So you just replace every number by its rank, right? And then you do the same for the y-axis, so we'll call that one, two, three, and so forth, right? And so then you do like a new 
plot where you don't plot the data, but you plot the rank of the data. And if you think about it, the rank of this data set is going to look an exact line. Because every time something was greater on the x-axis, it was also greater on the y-axis. So if we do a correlation on the rank, that's called a rank correlation. Okay. Um, so because I want to find the um, columns that are similar in a way that the random forest would find them similar, Random forests don't care about linearity, they just care about ordering, so a rank correlation is the, the right way to think about that. So um, Spearman's R is, is the name of the most common rank correlation, but you can literally replace the data with its rank and chuck it at the regular correlation and you'll get basically the same answer. The only difference is in how ties are handled, it's a pretty minor issue. Um, like if you had like a full parabola in that rank correlation, you'll you will not right rely right. On it has that, to be so. has to be monotonic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, once I've got a correlation matrix, uh, there's basically a, a couple of standard steps you do to turn that into a, a dendrogram, which I have to look up uh, on. Stack Overflow each time I do it. Um, you basically turn it into a distance matrix, and then you create something that tells you, you know, which things are connected to which other things hierarchically. So uh, this kind of uh, these two and this step here are like just three standard steps that you always have to do to create um, a dendrogram. Um, and so then you can plot it. Uh, and so. All right, so sale year and sale elapsed seem to be measuring basically the same thing, at least in terms of rank, which is not surprising, because sale elapsed is the uh, number of days since the first day in my data set. Uh, so obviously these two are nearly entirely correlated with some ties. Grouse attracts and hydraulics flow and coupler system all seem to be measuring the same thing. And this is interesting, because remember coupler system, it said, was super important. Right, and so this rather supports our hypothesis that it's nothing to do with whether it's a coupler system, but whether it's whatever kind of vehicle it is that has these kind of features. Um, product group and product group's desk seem to be measuring the same thing. FI base model and FI model desk seem to be measuring the same thing. And so once we get past that, everything else, like suddenly the things are further away, so I'm probably going to not worry about those. So we're going to look into these one, two, three, four groups that are very similar. Could you pass that over there? Um, is it implied in that graph that the similarity between stick length and enclosure is higher than with stick length and anything that's higher? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it it's a little hard to interpret, but given that stick length and enclosure don't join up until way over here, um, It, it would strongly suggest that then that they're a long way away from each other. Um, otherwise, you would expect them to have joined up earlier. I mean, it, it's it's possible to construct like a synthetic data set where you kind of end up joining things that were close to each other through different paths. So you've got to be a bit careful. But I think it's fair to, to probably assume that stick length or enclosure are probably very different. So they are very different, but would they be more similar than, for example, stick length and sale day of year. Sale day of Which year. Which is at the very top. No, there's nothing to suggest that here, because like the key point is to notice where they sit in this tree, right? And they both they, they sit in totally different halves of the tree. Okay, thank you. Um, but really to actually know that, the best way would be to actually look at the Spearman R correlation matrix. Right? If you just want to know how similar is this thing to this thing, the Spearman R correlation matrix tells you that. Can you pass that over there? So to this, we are passing the data frame, right? Say again? Uh, we are passing the data frame, or are we passing the model to it? This is just a data frame. So we're passing in DF keep. So that's the data frame containing the whatever it was, 30 or so features that our random forest thought was interesting. So there's no random forest being used here. The measure, the, the distance measure is being done entirely on rank correlation. So what I then do is I take these these groups, right, 
And I create a little function that I call get out of band score, right? Which is it does a random forest um, for some data frame. Um, uh, I make sure that I've uh, taken that data frame and split it into a training and validation set, uh, and then I call fit and return the OOB score, right? So um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try removing each one of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or so variables one at a time and see which ones I can remove and it doesn't make the OOB score get worse. Um, and each time I run this I get slightly different results, so actually it looks like last time I had seven things, not not eight things. So you can see I just do a loop through each of the things that I'm thinking like maybe I could get rid of this because it's redundant, and I print out the column uh, name and the OOB score of a model that is trained after dropping that one column. Okay, so the OOB score on my whole data frame is 0.89, and then after dropping each one of these things, they're basically none of them get much worse. Sale elapsed is getting quite a bit worse than sale year, but like it looks like pretty much everything else I can drop with like only like a third decimal place uh, problem. So obviously though, you've got to remember the dendrogram, like let's take FI model desk and FI base model, right? They're very similar to each other, right? So what this says isn't that I can get rid of both of them, right? I can get rid of one of them, because they're basically measuring the same thing, okay? So, so then I try it. I say, okay, let's try getting rid of one from each group. Say all year, FI base model, and Grouser tracks, okay? And like, let's now have a look. It's like, okay, I've gone from 0.890 to 0.888. It's like, again, so close as to be meaningless. So that sounds good. Uh, simpler is better. So I'm now going to drop those columns from my data frame. Um, and then I can try running the full model again. And I can see, you know, so reset RF samples. Um, means I'm using my whole data frame, uh, my whole uh, bootstrap sample, uh, use 40 estimators, and I've got uh, 0.907. Okay, so I've, I've now got a, a model which is smaller and simpler, uh, and I'm getting a, a good score for. Um, so at this point, I've now got rid of as many columns as I feel I comfortably can, ones that either didn't have a good feature importance or were highly related to other variables and the model didn't get worse significantly when I, when I removed them. So now I'm at the point where I want to try and really understand my data better by taking advantage of the model, and we're going to use something called partial dependence. And again, this is something that you could like use in a Kaggle kernel, and lots of people are going to appreciate this, because almost nobody knows about partial dependence, and it's a very, very powerful technique. What we're going to do is we're going to find out for the features that are important, how do they relate to the dependent variable, right? So let's have a look, right? So let's again, since we're doing interpretation, we'll set set our samples to 50,000 to run things quickly. Um, we'll take our data frame, um, we'll get our feature importance, and notice that we're using um, uh, max and cat because I'm actually pretty interested in terms of for, for interpretation and seeing the individual levels. Um, and so here's the top 10. And so let's try and learn more about those top 10. So year made is the second most important. So one obvious thing we could do would be to plot um, um, year made uh, against sale elapsed because as we've talked about already like it just seems to make sense They're both important But it seems very likely that they kind of combine together to find like how old was the The product when it was sold so we could try plotting year made against sale elapsed to see how they relate to each other and when we do we get this very ugly graph and it shows us that year made actually has a whole bunch that are a thousand Right, so clearly, you know, this is where I would tend to go back to the client or whatever and say, okay, I'm guessing that these bulldozers weren't actually made in the year 1000, and they would presumably say to me, oh yes, they're ones where we don't know when it was made, 
you know, uh, maybe before 1986 we didn't track that, or maybe um, the things that are sold in Illinois don't have that data provided, or or whatever. They'll tell us some reason. So, um, in order to uh, understand this plot better, I'm just going to remove them from this interpretation section of the analysis. So I'm just going to say, okay, let's just grab things where year made is greater than 1930. Okay. So let's now look at the relationship between year made and sale price. And there's a really great um, uh, package called ggplot. Um, ggplot originally was an R package. GG stands for the Grammar of Graphics. And the Grammar of Graphics is like this uh, very powerful way of thinking about um, how to produce charts in a very flexible way. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about it much in this class. There's lots of information available online, um, but I, I definitely recommend it uh, as, a, as a great package to use. ggplot, uh, which you can pip install, uh, it's part of the FastAI environment already. Um, uh, ggplot um, in Python has basically the same parameters and API as the R version. The R version is much better documented, so you should read its documentation to learn how to use it. Um, but basically you say, okay, I want to uh, create a plot um, of um, this data frame. Now, when you create plots, um, most of the data sets you're using are going to be too big to plot, uh, as in like if you do a scatter plot, it'll create so many dots that it's just a big mess, um, it'll take forever. And remember, when you're plotting things, you just you're you're looking at it, right? So there's no point plotting something with a hundred million samples. When if you only used 100,000 samples, it's going to be pixel identical, right? So that's why I call get sample first. So get sample just grabs a random sample. Okay, so I'm just going to grab 500 points um, for now. Okay, so I'm going to grab 500 points um, from my data frame. I got a plot uh, year made against sale price. AES stands for aesthetic. This is the basic way that you set up your columns in ggplot. Okay, so this says to plot these columns from this data frame, and then you, there's this weird thing in ggplot where plus means basically add chart elements. Okay, so I'm going to add a smoother. Um, so most of the very very often you'll find that a scatter plot is very hard to see what's going on because there's too much randomness. Whereas a smoother basically creates a little linear regression for every little subset of the graph. And so it kind of joins it up and allows you to see a nice smooth curve. Okay, um, so this is like the main way that I tend to look at univariate relationships. And uh, by adding standard error equals true, it also shows me the confidence interval of this smoother, right? Um, so low S stands for locally weighted regression, which is this idea of like doing kind of like doing lots of little um, linear regressions. Um, so we can see here the relationship between year made and sale price is kind of all over the place, right? Which is like not really what I would expect. I would I would have expected that more recent um, stuff that sold more recently uh, would probably be like more expensive because of inflation and because they're like more current models and so forth. And the problem is that when you look at a univariate relationship like this. There's a whole lot of um, collinearity going on, a whole lot of interactions that are being lost. So, for example, why did the price drop here? Is it actually because like things made between 1991 and 1997 are less valuable, or is it actually because most of them were also sold during that time, and actually there was like maybe a recession then? Or maybe it was like the product sold during that time, a lot more people were buying types of vehicle that were less expensive. Like, there's all kinds of reasons for that. And so again, as data scientists, one of the things you're going to keep seeing is that um, at the companies that you join, people will come to you with, with these kind of univariate charts, where they'll say like, oh my god, our sales in Chicago have, have disappeared, they've got really bad, or people aren't clicking on this ad anymore, and they'll show you a chart that looks like this, and they'll be like, what happened? And most of the time, you'll find the answer to the question, what happened, is that there's something else going on, right? So actually, oh, in Chicago last week, actually, we were doing a new promotion, and that's why our you know, revenue went down. It's not because people aren't buying stuff in Chicago anymore, it's because the prices were lower. 
for instance. So what we really want to be able to do is say, well, what's the relationship between sale price and year made, all other things being equal? So all other things being equal basically means if we sold something in 1990 versus 1980 and it was exactly the same thing to exactly the same person and exactly the same auction, so on and so forth, what would have been the difference in price? And so to do that we do something called a partial dependence plot. And this is a partial dependence plot. There's a really nice library which nobody's heard of um, called PDP, um, which does these partial dependence plots. And what happens is this. We've got our sample of 500 data points, right? And we're going to do something really interesting. We're going to take each one of those hundred randomly chosen auctions, and we're going to make a little data set out of it, right? So, like, here's our here's our ugh, come on, why not? Here's our data set of like 500 auctions, and here's our columns. One of which is the thing that we're interested in, which is year made. So here's year made. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're now going to try and create a chart where we're going to try and say all other things being equal in 1960, uh, how much did uh, bulldozers cost? How much did things cost in auctions? And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to replace the year made column. With 1960, we're going to copy in the value 1960 again and again and again all the way down, right? So now every row, the year made is 1960, and all of the other data is going to be exactly the same. And we're going to take our random forest and we're going to pass all this through our random forest to predict the sale price. So that will tell us for everything that was auctioned, how much do we think it would have been sold for? If that thing was made in 1960, and that's what we're going to plot here. All right, that's the price we're going to plot here, and then we're going to do the same thing for 1961. All right, we're going to replace all these and do 1961. Yeah. So, no, well, to be clear. Um, We've already fit the random forest. Yes. And then we're just passing a new year and seeing what it determines the price should be. Yeah. So this is a lot like the way we did feature importance. But rather than randomly shuffling the column, we're going to replace the column with a constant value. All right. So randomly shuffling the column tells us uh, how accurate it is when you don't use that column anymore. Uh, replacing the whole column with a constant tells us or estimates for us how much we would have sold that product for. Uh, in that auction, on that day, in that place, if that product had been made in 1961. Right? So we basically then take the average of all of the sale prices that we calculate from that random forest. And so we do it in 1961, and we get this value. Right? So what the partial dependence plot here shows us is each of these light blue lines actually is showing us all 500 lines. So it says um, for Row number one in our data set, um, if we sold it in 1960, we're going to index that to zero, right? So we'll call that zero, right? Um, if we sold it in 1970, that particular um, auction would have been here. If we sold it in 1980, it would have been here. If we sold it in 1990, it would have been here. So we actually plot all 500 um, predictions of how much every one of those 500 uh, auctions would have gone for. If we replace it, if we replace the year made with each of these different values, and then then this dark line here is the average, right? So this tells us uh, how much would we have sold uh, on average all of those auctions for if all of those products were actually made in 1985, 1990, 1993, 1994, and so forth. And so you can see what's happened here is at least in the period where we have a reasonable amount of data, which is since 1990, this is basically a totally straight line. Which is what you would expect, right? Because if it was sold on the same date, and it was the same kind of tractor, and it was sold to the same person in the same auction house, then you would expect more recent vehicles 
to be more expensive because of inflation and because they're they're newer Right? They're not they're not as second-hand and you'd expect that relationship to be roughly linear and that's exactly what we're finding Okay, so by removing all of these externalities it often allows us to see the truth much more clearly uh, there's a question at the back. Can you pass that back there? You're done. Okay. So um, um, this uh, this partial dependence plot concept is something which um, is using a random forest to get us a more clear interpretation of what's going on in our data. And so the steps were to first of all look at the feature importance. To tell us like which things do we think we care about and then to use the partial dependence plot to tell us what's going on on average All right there's another cool thing we can do with PDP is we can use clusters and what clusters does is it uses cluster analysis to look at all of these each one of the 500 rows and say um, does some of those 500 rows kind of move in the same way And like we can kind of see it seems like there's a whole lot of rows that kind of go down and Then up and there seems to be a bunch of rows that kind of go up and then go flat like it does seem like there are some kind of different types of behaviors being hidden and So here is the result of doing that cluster analysis right is we still get the same average But it says here are kind of the five most common shapes that we see uh, and this is where you could then go in and say all right It looks like some kinds of vehicle um, Actually after 1990 their prices are pretty flat and before that they were pretty linear Some kinds of vehicle are kind of exactly the opposite and so like different kinds of vehicle have these different shapes Right, and so this is something you could dig into. I think there was one at the back. Oh, you could okay So what are we going to do with this information? Well the purpose of Interpretation is to learn about a data set and so why do you want to learn about a data set? It's because you it's because you want to do something with it, right? So in this case um, It's not so much something if you're trying to win a Kaggle competition I mean it can be a little bit like some of these insights might make you realize oh I could Transform this variable or create this interaction or whatever um, obviously feature importance is super important for Kaggle competitions um, But this one's much more for like real life You know, so this is when you're talking to somebody and you say to them like um, Okay, those plots you've been showing me which actually say that like there was this kind of dip in prices You know based on like things made between 1990 and 1997 There wasn't really you know actually it was they were increasing there was actually something else going on at that time um, You know, it's, it's basically the thing that allows you to say like For whatever this outcome I'm trying to drive in my business is this is how something's driving it, right? So if it's like um, uh, I'm looking at you know kind of advertising technology what's driving clicks then I'm actually digging in to say okay This is actually how clicks are being driven. This is actually the variable that's driving it This is how it's related. So therefore we should change our behavior in this way so That's really the goal of any model Uh, I guess there's two possible goals one goal of a model is just to get the predictions like if you're doing hedge fund trading You probably just want to know what the price of that equity is going to be if you're doing insurance You probably just want to know how much claims that guy's going to have but probably most of the time You're actually trying to change Something about how you do business how you do marketing how you do logistics So the thing you actually care about is how the things are related to each other All right, I'm sorry, can you explain again when you scroll up and you were looking at the sale price year May looking at the entire model and you saw that dip And you said something about that dip did it signify what we thought it did can you explain why yeah about that? So this is like a classic Boring univariate plot right so this is basically just taking all of the dots all of the auctions plotting year made against sale price and we're going to just fitting a rough average through them and so um, It's true that products made between 1992 and 1997 on average in our data set are being sold for less 
So like very often in business, you'll hear somebody look at something like this and they'll be like, oh, we should um, We should stop auctioning equipment that is made in that year in those years because like we're getting less money for for example But if the truth actually is that during those years um, uh, It's just that people were making more um, small industrial equipment where you would expect it to be sold for less and actually our profit on it is just as high for instance or During those years. It's not that it's not things made during those years now would have um, Would be cheaper. It's that during those years When we were selling things in those years they were cheaper because like there was a recession going on so if you're trying to like actually take some action based on this You probably don't just care about the fact that things made in those years are cheaper on average, but how does that impact today, you know, so So this this approach where we actually say let's try and remove all of these externalities So if something is sold on the same day to the same person of the same kind of vehicle Then actually how does year made impact price and so this basically says for example if I am Deciding what to buy at an auction then this is kind of saying to me. Okay, like Getting a more recent vehicle on average really does on average give you more money um, Which is not what the kind of the the naive univariate plot said uh, I can pass it to Tyler um, So uh... For like this bulldozer, uh, bulldozers made in 2010 probably are not close to the type of bulldozers that were made in 1960. Right. And if you're taking something that would be so very different, like a 2010 bulldozer, and then trying to just drop it to say, oh, if it was made in 1960, that may cause poor uh, prediction at a point because it's so yeah, far outside absolutely of the training set. absolutely so you know I think that's a good point it's you know it's a, a limitation of a random forest is if you've got a kind of data point that's like of a kind you know which is kind of like in a part of the space that it's not seen before like maybe people didn't put air conditioning really in bulldozers in 1960 and you're saying how much would this Bulldozer with air conditioning have gone for in 1960. You don't really have any information to know that. So, you know, you, it's a, uh, it's it's this is still the best technique I know of, but it's it's not perfect. Um, and you know, you kind of hope that the trees are still going to find some useful truth, even though it hasn't seen that combination of features before. Um, but yeah, it's something to be aware of So you can um, also do uh, the same thing uh, in a PDP interaction plot and a PDP interaction plot Which is really what I'm trying to get to here is like how to sale elapsed and year made together Impact price and so if I do a PDP interaction plot it shows me sale elapsed versus price it shows me year made versus price and it shows me the combination versus price. Remember, this is always log of price. That's why these prices look weird, right? And so you can see that the combination of sale elapsed and year made is, as you would expect, um, uh, later dates, so more elapsed time, um, is giving me. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around, isn't it? So the highest prices are those where there's the least elapsed. And the most recent year made. Um, so you can see here, there's the univariate relationship between sale elapsed and price, um, and here is the univariate relationship between year made and price, um, and then here is the combination of the two. Um, it's enough to see like clearly that these two things are driving price together. Um, you can also see these are not like simple diagonal lines, so it's kind of some interesting interaction going on. Um, and so based on looking at these plots, um, it's enough to make me think, oh, we, we should maybe put in some kind of interaction term and see what happens. So let's come back to that in a moment, but let's just look at a couple more. Um, remember in this case, I did one hot encoding uh, way back at the top here. 
I said max n cat equals 7. So I've got like n closure erupts with AC. So uh, if you've got one hot encoded variables, um, you can pass an array of them uh, to pit plot PDP and it'll treat them as uh, a category. Right? And so in this case, I'm going to create um, a PDP plot of these three categories. I'm going to call it enclosure. Uh, and I can see here that uh, enclosure erupts with AC uh, on average are more expensive than enclosure erupts and enclosure erupts. It actually looks like enclosure erupts and enclosure erupts are pretty similar, where else erupts with AC is higher. Um, so this is, you know, at this point, you know, I'd probably be inclined to hop into Google and like type erupts and erupts and find out what the hell these things are. Uh, and here we go. So it turns out that erupts is enclosed rollover protective structure, uh, and so um, it turns out that if your um, um, your bulldozer is fully enclosed, then optionally you can also get air conditioning. So it turns out that actually this thing is telling us whether it's got air conditioning. If it's an open structure, then obviously you don't have air conditioning at all. So that's what these three levels are, and so we've now learnt. Um, all other things being equal, the same bulldozer, sold at the same time, built at the same time, sold to the same person, is going to be quite a bit more expensive if it has air conditioning than if it doesn't. Okay, so again, we're kind of getting this nice interpretation ability. And you know, now that I've spent some time with this data set, I've certainly noticed that this, you know, knowing this is the most important thing, you do notice that there's a lot more air-conditioned bulldozers nowadays than they used to be, and so there's definitely an interaction between kind of date and that. So based on that earlier interaction analysis, I've tried, um, first of all, setting everything before 1950 to 1950, because it seems to be some kind of missing value. Uh, I've then set age to be equal to uh, sale year minus year made, um, and so then I try running a random forest on that, and indeed, Age is now the single biggest thing. Uh, sale elapsed is way back down here. Uh, year made is back down here. So we've kind of used this to find uh, an interaction. Um, but remember, of course, a, a random forest can create a, can create an interaction through having multiple split points. So we shouldn't assume that this is actually going to be a better result. Um, and in practice, I actually found when I uh, looked at my score uh, and my RMSC, adding age was actually a little worse. Um, we'll see about that um, later, probably in the next lesson. Okay. Um, so one last thing is a tree interpreter. Um, so uh, this is also in the category of things that most people don't know exist, but it's super important. Uh, almost pointless for like Kaggle competitions, but super important for real life. And here's the idea. Um, let's say you're an insurance company, and uh, somebody rings up and you give them a quote, and they say, oh, that's $500 more than last year. Why? Okay, so in general, you've made a prediction from some model, and somebody asks why. And so this is where we use this um, method called uh, tree interpreter. And what tree interpreter does is it allows us to take um, a particular row. So in this case, we're going to pick row number zero, right? So here, uh, here is row zero, right? Uh, presumably this is like a year made. I don't know what all the codes stand for, but like here's, here's all of the columns in row zero. What I can do with a tree interpreter is I can go ti.predict, pass in my random forest, pass in my row, so this would be like this particular customer's insurance information, or this, in this case this particular auction, right? and it'll give me back three things. The first is the prediction from the random forest. The second is the bias. The bias is basically the average sale price across the whole original data set. Right? So like remember in a random forest, we started with single trees. Uh, 
Oh, we haven't got a draw in there anymore. But remember, we started with a single tree in our random forest. And we split it once, and then we split that once, and then we split that once, right? And we said, like, oh, what's the average value for the whole data set? Then what's the average value for those where the first split was true? And then what's the average value where the next split was also true? Until eventually you get down to the leaf nodes where you've got the average value you predict, right? So you can kind of think of it this way. If this, for a single tree, if this is our final leaf node, right, maybe we're predicting like 9.1, Right, and then maybe the average log sale price for the whole um, uh, the whole lot is like 10.2. Right, that's the average for all the options, and so you could kind of like work your way down here. So in fact, let's go and create this. Tr uh, let's actually go and run this so we can see it. Okay, so um, let's go back and redraw this single tree. You'll find like in um, Jupyter notebooks often. A lot of the things we create, like videos, progress bars, and stuff, they don't know how to like save themselves to the file. So you'll see just like a little string here, and so you actually have to rerun it um, to create the string. Uh, um, so this was the single tree that we created. Um, so the whole data set. Had an average log sale price of 10.2. Uh, the data set for those with cut plus system equals true had an average of 10.3. Um, the data set for cut plus system equals true enclosure less than point uh, less than two was 9.9. .9. And then eventually we get all the way up here, uh, and also model ID less than 45.73. It's 10.2. So you could kind of like say, okay. Why did this particular row, let's say we had a row that ended up over in this leaf node, why did we predict 10.2? Well, it's because we started with 10.19, and then because the coupler system was was tr was less than 0.5, so it was actually false, um, we added about 0.2 to that, so we went from 10.1 to 10.3, right, so 10.2 to 10.3, so we added a little bit because this one is true. And then to go from 10.3 to 9.9, .9, so because enclosure is less than 2, we subtracted uh, about 0.4, and then because model ID was less than 4,500, we added about 0.7. Right? So you could see, like with a single tree, you could like break down like why is it that we predicted 10.2, right? And it's like at each one of these decision points, we're adding or subtracting a little bit from the value. Um, so what we could then do is we could do that for all the trees, and then we could take the average. So every time we see enclosure, did we increase or decrease the value and how much by? Every time we see model ID, did we increase or decrease the value and how much by? And so we could take the average of all of those, and that's what ends up in this thing called contributions. So here is all of our predictors, and here is the value of each. And so this is telling us, and I've uh, sorted them here, that um, the fact that this thing was made in 1999 was the thing that m most negatively impacted our prediction. And the fact that the age of the vehicle was uh, 11 years was what most positively impacted. Um, I think you actually need to sort after you zip them together. They seem to be sorted. Negative point five. Well, no, the nine. values are sorted, but then they're just reassigned to the columns in the original order, which is uh, why an eleven-year-old tractor is what's most thank you. impacting price. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Yes, we need to do an index sort. Okay. Thank you. We'll make sure we fix that by next week. So we need to sort. Columns by the index from um, contributions. So then there's this thing called bias, and so the bias is just the uh, the average with, before we start doing any splits, right? So if you basically start with the average um, log of value, 
and then we went down each tree and each time we saw a year made we had some impact coupler system some impact product size some impact and so forth right um, okay so I think what we might do is we might come back to because we're kind of out of time we might come back to tree interpreter um, next time um, but the basic idea this is the last uh, this was the last of our key interpretation points and the basic idea is that um, we want some ability to um, not only tell us about the model as a whole and how it works on average, but to look at how the model makes predictions for an individual row. Um, and that's what we're doing here. Okay, great. Thanks everybody. See you on Thursday.